end. Amen. Would y'all please open your Bibles to Philippians, to that passage that Steve read for us, Philippians chapter 1. Hey, I want to remind y'all, we got a group of folks out on the Navajo Res now. They're uh, serve, probably serving, about to serve Thanksgiving to uh, some brothers and sisters um, out at Pine Hill Church. They left out on Friday, and uh, they'll be making their way back on Monday. There was an earlier group that left earlier in the week to kind of go up and prepare some things, but pretty good number of folks out there serving now, so I want to be mindful of them and prayerful for them, if y'all would commit to, to pray for them today for fruit, but then also for their safety and everything getting back, and we're thankful for them being willing to get out and serve uh, in Jesus' name, representing our church, most importantly, representing Jesus Christ. So there you are in Philippians chapter 1, and we're in a series on uh, Thanksgiving. And so uh, three weeks ago when we started talking about this, we said that Thanksgiving for the Christian is something that goes up to a, a person in Jesus Christ, that we're not just warm and fuzzy about the stuff that God's given us that we feel like we've approved and go, oh, I'm thankful for you know, all these different things, but rather we are able to go to the nail-scarred hands of Jesus and look and say, and, 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 and take that all the way up and seek his face and say, thank you, Jesus, for what you have given me in my life. And, and that gives us a framework by way of the gospel good news of Jesus Christ to thank him not just for what I deem uh, good in my life, and that, that's fine to be thankful to, to Jesus for those things, but the things that he has put into my life that I might, I might even say are hindrances, or I'm, but they came from his hand. And so we can trust him. And so Thanksgiving for us is this thing where we, go, we can look, look, at, look at the hands of Jesus and say, thank you for what you've done for me on the cross. And he who did not spare his own son, will he not also graciously give us all things? So when I look at the nail-scarred hand of Jesus, I can look at everything else and go, all right, all of these things in my life, I can be thankful for so we're really gonna we're gonna stretch that out a little bit to all the way to people. You'd be thankful for all kinds of things, but would you be thankful to the people in your life? The Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians writes to Philippian believers, and I don't I'm not trying to discount that. Uh, and so he's thankful for them, but I want us to see that there is an abiding principle of just the love of people. And, and, and the thankfulness for people. So I don't know, I don't know what your holiday season uh, looks like. This may or may not be um, your case in particular. Y'all might not gather for Thanksgiving or Christmas or those kinds of things. But um, my, at least in my mind was that you might approach the people that you might not connect with on a very regular basis. But you might go into this with the gospel of Jesus in your heart. And it might change the way you view people and that you'd be able to be thankful for them. That you'd love them. Uh, that's, what, that's what God has called us to do. And, and what we got here in Philippians 1, it's pretty remarkable the way he starts this book. Or, you know, we're looking at, at verse 3. Um, this, uh, this, this book, book of Philippians, is about joy. You know, it's, it's 16 times in the book of Philippians, just four chapters, the emphasis is put on joy. But you cannot, you cannot have real joy unless you are thankful. <laughs> Uh, a, uh, an entitled heart is not a thankful heart, and an entitled heart is not a joyful heart. And if we're not careful, that can, that can ease in on all of us. And here in verse 3, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and I say that because it's almost like I need to know he's under oath when he says these things, because the, the, what he says here is so outrageous, it's like, really? But yeah, inspired by the Holy Spirit in truth, the Apostle Paul, from a prison cell, like I don't even know what some of us might even have to say that could be remotely enjoyable if we're writing from a prison cell, but he is. He gives us this gospel-fueled thankfulness for sinful, flawed people. And that's something that you and I can have too. All right? By way of the gospel, not, not because he's a... It's not just that he's a more remarkable person or a better person or that there's better people in here in, in, in this and that, but rather that this is because of Jesus that we can have this this sort of gospel-fueled thankfulness for flawed people. Look at what he says here, and think about what he says here in verse 3. Check this out. I thank my God in all my remembrances of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Now, this is um, underline or highlight in your Bible or whatever. Um, I, thank my, uh, I thank my God, and he, so he's, he's looking to God, and then he says, all 
all my remembrances. He doesn't have one bad memory of these folks. <laughs> Every remembrance that he has is good. Really? I mean, and then he says, always, I always thank God. I don't, I, don't, I don't lack in thanking God for you. And then he says, in every prayer. So what's your prayer life like? I mean, my prayer life, I can say any, and hopefully you know this and by, by way of Jesus Christ. He's paid, he's paid it all. You can approach the throne with boldness. And I can say anything I want to God. He's my father. I can talk to him about anything. So Paul gives us like this insight into his prayer life and his, his intimate, close moments with God where he can say anything that he wants. And in these moments with God, he says, every prayer I pray for you is full of joy and full of thankfulness for this particular people. Now, what do you think? Like we really have to figure out, think about, is he just like being nice? Like just saying things to try to build him up, but he really doesn't feel that way. In other words, lying, which that would really discredit the entire Bible because we found something in here that was a lie. So we don't want to do that. Um, did he not know these people very well? Did he just kind of got to, you know, you can do that. Like they seem like such great people from a distance, but no, no, that, that wasn't the case. He was, he was very close to them. He knew them very well. Or how about this? Um, they were just perfect people. I mean, the Philippians, they just, they just were, were great people, easy to get along with. And, and that's, not, that's not the case either. They were, they were sinners. Um, this particular book of the Bible, this letter, is not, not an easy setting that it, was, that it was placed in. The church at Philippi was situated in a Roman province of Macedonia, Macedonia, so it did not start in a synagogue. So it's not like they had this monotheistic understanding of God to start with. They had all of the things that Romans had. Um, Philippi was named after King Philip who was the father of Alexander the Great. All right, I misspoke that last service. <clears throat> I got it right now. He was named after King Philip, the father of Alexander the Great. So it wasn't just Roman. It was very Roman. And it was, an, it was a, like a military outpost for Romans. So it's like the Fort Hood of Macedonia right here. It's very, very Roman place. That did not savvy very well with early Christianity. They, just so you know, they had a lot of work to do in their life. A lot of undoing. This would have been a very difficult place to pastor. It would have been a very difficult place to follow Jesus. And yet, you got the Apostle Paul saying, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always, every prayer of mine. Making my prayer with joy. So some of you got to know, like some of these people were annoying. Some of these people were narcissistic. Some of these people drove, probably drove slow in the left lane and they drank unsweetened tea even though they weren't on a diet. Like those, you know, they probably liked Pepsi. I don't know. I mean, they didn't like Bluebell. There, was, there had to have been something in there. And Paul knew them very well. So here's the thing. that They didn't, they didn't look much different than the Christians you meet today. That, that's what I'm trying to say. He knew these folks were put in his life by God. That's the key. It's not that they were great, uh, exceptional, amazing people. It's that he knew he had this theological understanding. And I, what I just mean is the gospel was changing him, man. The gospel changed Paul's life all the way to his heart and the way that he looked at people. And, and, when you, and when you know that, even if they're not followers of Jesus, like I said, you can still have a favorable view of the people that are around you knowing that God has put them into your life. And they're part of his purpose for you. I love football. Y'all got to gotta bear with me every once in a while. I try not to do it, like just gives constant football illustrations all the time. But every once in a while, you just gotta, it's just going to come out. So here we are. Um, I love all sports. And um, football was not my main one as far as being uh, excelling at it or anything. But I love football. And, it, and it, it's because it has, I think, I've come to conclude it has a rare brotherhood associated with it that I personally didn't experience in other sports, even though I love them very much. Probably, did, probably didn't hurt that when uh, I showed up for two-a-days as a senior in high school, we all got shirts that said family on them. That's what said real big letters across front, family. I was in a place right then and there where I didn't really have a whole lot. didn't feel like I had a whole lot of that going on. And I was like, huh, family. Could I have a family? Well, what is a, what is a family made up of? Families are not, they're, not uh, they're, they're, they're diverse, right? They're different ages and different you know, uh, seasons of life and sizes and everything else. I was talking to uh, Coach Egger after the service a while ago. He said, we got football pants, everything from extra small right up to triple XL, right? Here's the thing about football. Anybody can play it. It's not one body type. Like in basketball, you know, everybody's, you know, the, you got tennis ball uh, calves or something like that, and you, there's just a certain thing that, like, all right, he looks like a hooper. I can see him standing at a Home Depot and say, the guy looks like a hooper. Football, every body type is not just welcomed. Every body type is needed, right? 
So you got, you got all this diversity coming together, different people, different shapes and sizes and abilities and all these kinds of things, but yet they work together. And they don't just work together. They have a lot of joy and, and, and a lot of fun together. They hold each other accountable. They celebrate as a team when they, when they win. They even celebrate each other. One of the, one of the best things, and I, obviously I watch high school football more than anything, but I love watching young men succeed and make a great play or something. But one of the things, and, and I love that, that's great. But one of my favorite things is seeing them succeed and then turning and looking. And what do they look? They're not looking at me. They're not looking up at the crowd. They're, you know, they're not looking at themselves even. They don't, they don't celebrate alone. They're looking for their buddies. They're looking, they look over and they find somebody and they run up and do like a butt five or whatever that I would need therapy. Like I would be out forever. I'd need a chiropractor every every one of them. And then when they do that, they celebrate with the brother. And then what do they do? They take a, they make a beeline for the sideline and they get over there and they, and a coach usually meets them out as far as, as they can. And they're celebrating with them and they're doing all this. And then they get over on the sideline and it's more celebrating. It's compounded because you know what? They just, they love each other. Are they exceptional people? Is that what it is? Is football just made up the very just high quality, never make mistakes, they're just kind of sinless, you know? If you ever played, you know that's not the case. It's, it's not, it certainly wasn't the case for me, so it's not that they're, by and large, exceptional people. It's that they have this commonality, this brotherhood, that they share together, and they end up looking at each other through a different lens. Uh... They literally risk their own bodily injury for the good of the team. They hurt for each other because that's what it takes to win. And that's what it takes to achieve a high level of success in football. And so football, in football, every relationship matters. You know that? Every relationship matters. You, you got I mean, I, I specifically remember having conflict, somebody in the, Somebody gets burned on a pass or something, and by somebody I mean me. And then the defensive line that we're talking about in practice turns around and yells something at me, and I'm walking at him, and he's walking at me. And what does the coach say? Take off! And he's making him run because we don't we we don't have room for that kind of conflict. We got to get along. Why do we got to get along? Because we're great people. No, because we have a we have a greater purpose, a purpose that's that's bigger than us. All right. Well, here's the thing: football is just football, but on a much grander much more important scale, the people in your life, the, the ones that you'll likely be connected with over the next few weeks, given Thanksgiving and Christmas, do you know that God put them in your life and, and, and that you and I should and can genuinely thank God for the people because we view them through a gospel lens. Just like a football player sees his teammates as different, he looks at them through a different lens, knowing that they have a common purpose. We look at the people in our life on a much grander scale, and we're seeing that they are a providential part of a beautiful journey for the glory of God, every single person in your life. You have, you have never met just an average person. Eugene Peterson said, people are not problems to be solved. They're mysteries to be explored. They have stories, and they have things to afford you, and they have, uh, they have ways to, even the people you say, well, man, some of these people drive me nuts. They're driving you nuts for the glory of God. Some of these people were, can you imagine, some of us bump into flawed people our entire life and wonder why. Like, do we think we're just a magnet for it? Nope, that's just reality. And flawed people coming into our life serve us. How do they serve us? First and foremost, they drive us to the feet of Jesus. And they don't, we, we're, we're done with this delusion to think that people are our saviors. And so they, they, they serve us even in those ways. So let me show you this. I think the Apostle Paul, he gives us this gospel-fueled thankfulness for even flawed people. He gives us his recipe for this. Paul's going to show us how he's able to be so thankful for sinful people. So I'm going to start back in verse 3. And we'll just, I mean, let me give you three things. So he said, I thank God in all my remembrance of you, always in my prayer, uh, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy. And then in verse five, because of your partnership. If you underline or write stuff down or whatever, do that to partnership. Because of your partnership in the gospel for the first day, from the first day until now. So the first thing, first ingredient 
for being able to be thankful for even the flawed people in our lives by way of the gospel is a value of fellowship. Yet a value of fellowship. That word partnership, as I said to circle, it is also translated fellowship. It means a deep friendship. It's a word that we are, says that we are in this together for a common goal. And for Paul, he had a history with the Philippians that included a gospel friendship. They had partnered with him on the greatest endeavor that anybody can on the face of the planet, the gospel good news of Jesus Christ that takes you from death to life, that makes you sing, thank you, God, for saving me. And then you find some people that are willing to sing that with you and you share that life with them. This is a friendship like no other. This is a partnership. This is a fellowship. And so you got that. You got that. You, I hope you got that. If you ain't got that, you can find that here in this church. You got people in your church. You got people in your small group. You got people in, in former churches that you know we're in this together for the glory of God and Jesus Christ. Jesus changed us so much that we just don't really feel like we fit in where he's not being glorified anymore. And so think about this because this, this, this makes you thankful for a whole lot of people, not just in your church. But um, how many people in your extended family have helped you help make you the person of faith in Jesus Christ that you are right now? These people have a, should have, for me and you, a special place in our wall of gratitude. They are not to be taken for granted. Thank God for them. I think of my grandparents. I think of my aunts, my uncles, cousins, parents, my sisters. None of these people made my faith. God did that. But he used them. He used them in various ways. And if Paul was writing a letter to them, and I'm, or I'm writing like Paul does, I could reach out to them and go, man, I am so thankful for you. I thank God in all my remembrances of you. Is it because they're perfect people and they never made mistakes? No, it's because what they've done for my faith in Jesus Christ has rightfully overshadowed every other misstep and everything else they did. Because they helped me know God. What's better? Than, there's nothing better than that. Even Grandma's pecan pie, which was delectable, all right? The gospel's even better than that. So I ought to be, I ought to be able to have that, that thankfulness. What about if it's not a gospel partnership? How about the people in your life who've just contributed to who you are? That's worth noting and remembering. That's worth thanking God, isn't it? Maybe, again, maybe God used them to sanctify you. God, God does that. He brings flawed people into your life. If you draw closer to him and no one is in your life by accident. So our relationships, even the ones that have put a strain on us, they're part of who we are. And thank God for that. So I would love to see this Thanksgiving, Christmas, and things. Like, I just, I mean, I just want, I just, I just love y'all. I mean, I just really want God for you and the love of God in your life. Like, I don't, there's not like a, nobody's, you know, hey, Roy, can you get those people to love each other and we'll reward you somehow. I just, I just, I can't believe I, I get, I get to, I get to have the gospel in my heart. I just want this for you, you know? Love. The love of God deepen in your heart, deep in your heart in such a way that it goes out of you. Look around and, and, and think of all the glorious things that you have in common with, with everyone. We're conditioned, I think, to be polarized right now. Not that we haven't, not that there's not enough sin in all of us to want to be polarized all the time. But I think in the day and age that we live in, or, or, and I don't think I know, in the day and age we live in, that we're in a world of constant conflict and we have access to it all, a front row seat to watching all this conflict all the time. And this is my opinion. I think we reenact those things in our life. I think we're, it's kind of shallow of a, it's not, it's shallow of us if that's what we're doing. Okay, it's just theory. I don't, I don't have data for it yet, but I think you watch a bunch of conflict either on the news or through social media or whatever, and you see it happening. And then you kind of look for that same kind of conflict to reenact. Just like I used to, uh, you know, I was the Cowboys quarterback in my backyard. I just go watch them and then I go emulate. You know, just we're watching these things and we're in a weird way we're admiring them and then we look for them and we find them. We look for that sort of conflict and then we get engaged and then we're, it's a weird sort of reenactment. Friends, we are not called to a worldly reenactment. We're called to a gospel reenactment. And, 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 and you let the rest of the world, you let them look for reasons to divide. And me and you in Jesus Christ, we'll be looking for reasons to build bridges. For the sake of the gospel and the glory of God. Let them do that. That, that quote is well filled of people who are looking for a reason to divide. Several years ago, I went to my aunt's house. Thanksgiving is too big for our family to, to get together like we used to. My mom's got one, two, three sisters. 
and now they all have kids, and we're, there's like thousands of us. But back in the days, not, not that long ago, probably like 2015, 2016, something like that, we were still doing that. And I got to my uh, aunt's house over in, in between, over by, uh, out in the country by Tom Bean. And I roll up to my aunt and uncle's house. My uncle's last name is Uden, so we call it Oots Giving, naturally. And so we pull up to Oots Giving, and I get to the back door, and there's a sign on the door um, that says, we're not going to talk about politics in this house. And, it, and it's Thanksgiving, and it's, you know, there had been a very controversial election that had just taken place. So he said, we are not going to talk about politics in this house. And um, here's the thing. We had a greater partnership. We had a better fellowship. And my, and my uncle noted that, and he said, we're going to be different. Hey, would you be different? For the glory of God and gospel in your heart, would you, would you be different? Maybe not be so quick to write people off or argue with them or find a reason to distance yourself from them. You know what we did do that Thanksgiving? Um, we didn't talk about politics, but at some point in the day, and I've shared this with y'all before, one of my aunts comes flying around the room with sheets of paper in her hand. And, like, there's, there's a ton of people there. I don't want to think, like, seven people in a house. Like, this is, there's tons of people there. Some of these people don't know the Lord. Some of them don't go to church or anything like that. But she was not you know, discriminant about who she was giving these pieces of paper to. Here's one for you. 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 And we all coming in here. Y'all get, y'all get in here. Get in here. And then we get in there and we've all got our piece of paper. You know what's on the piece of paper? It's lyrics to a song. She didn't ask, would you like to sing? She said, you're going to sing boy. And you're going to hold my purse while we're doing it. Right? That's the way my hands and people I grew up with in my life work. It's not like, you know, it's not by committee. Like we're about to sing and here's what we're singing. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. Count your blessings. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. And everybody sings. So what they're doing is they're just, they're just setting the tone for not division, but thankfulness to God and the blessings that he's given us. And then me and Q sat down at the table and beat my cousin and his girlfriend at 42 dominoes because that's what we do, all right? It's not all just, I don't want to think it's some holier than now sort of, we had Thanksgiving, you know? But I, 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 I'm, I'm, I, I'm thankful, you know, I'm thankful for them and I, and I learned things from, from that because the reality is if my uncle doesn't put that sign on the door, we probably do that. We probably just engage in the same stuff we do everywhere else. Would you put that sign? I'm not telling you to print a sign and put it on your, would you just put it on your heart? I'm not going to look for things to, to be conflicted with people about. Would you just maybe just work towards loving them and, Jim, man, just enjoy that? Not everyone is your friend, you know, but you can be friendly to everyone. Jesus Christ has done that in our heart, right? I want to give a qualifying statement before I move forward on this. Because some people have been abused and some people have been sinned against deeply and unrepentantly. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about playing nice with them. That's not what I'm talking about. Jesus talks about these things in Matthew chapter 18 and that sort of conflict. So please don't hear me that, that you're because you, you're sensitive on that if that's you and you feel guilty. And, and uh, I, I, I don't think you need to feel guilty if that you. I know you don't need to feel guilty if that's you. Um, I guess what I'm saying is I don't know if you've done all the work of forgiveness that you need to do, but you can bless that person with your absence if they've, if they've hurt you deeply in that way. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you need to engage in stuff that's just going to repeatedly hurt you. What I am saying is, generally speaking, the natural day-to-day -day stuff where we just bump into each other and have conflict, that you and I need to have a gospel lens to overlook those kinds of things, and we can. For a second ingredient, let's look at verse 6. And I, uh, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Really, Paul, you're so sure that God's going to do a great work in the life of these people. Because Paul says, I'm sure that the work I've seen in you is going to continue. I don't know. Have they, are they really on track the way that they How can you say that from prison? He says, though, when he says, look at the way he, the way he says, he says, he that began a good work in you will bring it to completion. So he's indicating here that they're not completed, that there's room for growth. He says that, that you have a beginning, and he's believing that, that that growth is going to continue. So imagine if he's not optimistic. Here's my, here's my number. Here's my second, my second ingredient. A disposition of optimism, hope, and grace. I know that's three things, but I couldn't land on one, so y'all leave me alone. 
a disposition of optimism, hope, and grace. Imagine if Paul is writing to these people who have a beginning, but they are not complete, and he's not optimistic. What's he going to say? He said, you guys, you know, you really haven't grown as much as you could have. And that would be true. He's just kind of being negative. You, you kind of stun it in your growth, it seems like. And you kind of, kind of makes me think that you might not even be, you know, real Christians like me, Paul could think. He's way more mature than that. I'm not real sure at this point, but if y'all keep trying hard and do all the spiritual disciplines, go to church and never miss, give a lot, then maybe. That's not what he said. Here's what he's doing. Paul was realistically believing the best in people, not because he thought they were great and extraordinary people. He said it in the text, but because he believed in the power of God. He said, God, if God began a good work in you, he will. He will bring it to completion. And, and you, you and I can say that. We, we, can, we can believe in the power of God in people and have a favorable view and an optimistic view about their future. How, you say, well, what if that's not right? It, would it be really good to be pessimistic about it? How, what good is that going to do? Um, what if you just, this book I've read called a, a Loving Life, he talks about setting your love on people. What if you just kind of set your love on people and believe the best in them because you believe, the, you believe in God and you believe in the life-changing power of Jesus Christ and you just said, you ain't all you ought to be and I ain't either, but I'm just going to love you anyway because that's what Jesus did for me. You know, there's an old uh, kid song that said, um, He's still working on me to make me what ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth, and Jupiter and Mars. How wonderfully perfect I must be. He's still working on me. There's something to that, to saying that I ain't, I'm not perfect, but, man, God must be, he must be really doing in something in me to take so long to work on me. That's a favorable view of looking at it rather than just like I'm not who I ought to be. I guess God's not real. How about this? Philippians 4.8. Anytime you just want to play the Jesus card, just whip out Philippians 4.8. I know this is, this is tough, but check it out. Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Would you do that for the people in your life? Would you look for things that are lovely, for the things that are commendable, for things that are excellent, for something worthy of praise? Would you think about these things? I got a buddy who just retired from the Air Force. Oh, I can't remember. He's in D.C. right now. But he moves all over the place. Alamogordo, New Mexico, London, England. He was everywhere. And I said, man, which of those place, places did you like best? He goes, well, there's this and that. And the other goes, you know, but I liked them all. He said, what I found in moving around in the Air Force is that people are either going to like everywhere they are or hate everywhere they are. It all depends on what you're looking for. The Apostle Paul says there's something to that. If you got something good, then dwell on it. Look for it. Um, you may be thinking, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen that work begin in some of the people in my life. Well, then I'm sure you've been praying for them, right? You've seen no glimmer of the gospel fruit in their life, so I know they're on your prayer list, right? Because they ought to be for me and you. We ought to be praying for those people we see no gospel fruit in. And you know what happens when we begin to pray for people? Our attitude towards them changes. And then we see them, we might actually look for the good that we've been praying for rather than just kind of categorically writing them off and going, eh. So pray for them if you haven't seen it. And then have a hopeful expectation of optimism that God is answering that prayer because God's answered a lot of yours and mine prayers. That alone will change the dynamics of a relationship and open up the, floor, open up the floodgates of gospel love even if you haven't seen that gospel fruit in their life. What about this? What about people? This is an especially difficult time of year for people who have lost loved ones recently or even, I mean, it could be years. The holidays just kind of bring up that, that hard stuff that you got to deal with. So what about people who have passed on? We can't, can't see, you know, these kinds of favorable things. What if you tried to intentionally remember the blessing they've been and thank God for the time that you had with them in Jesus' name? Oh, please, I'm not saying that you neglect all hurt. I'm not saying that you just live, but I am saying that we can remember what, how God blessed us through them as well. And that that can temper everything. It can definitely make it much more manageable. It won't fix the hurt, but it can definitely make And it's right. It's the gospel. It's applying the gospel to people that we don't have anymore. There's only two ways to, for followers of Jesus to view people. 
two ways. One's family. They believe in Jesus Christ. They're my brother and sister. God's, God's our heavenly father. They're my brother and sister. If that is the case, I have a unique responsibility to love them in a sacrificial way. And the, and the New Testament is chock full of all kinds of one another commands that push me towards loving my brothers and sisters in Christ in a unique and sacrificial way. That's one family. The second one, people who don't know the Lord, lost people, people who were just like me and you once were, separated from Christ and in need of the gospel, don't do this in a sort of I'm patting you on the head because you need it way, but they are your mission field. They're somebody you're called to, to reach. They are image bearers of God, which we could just go on and on and on. They have a capacity for the glory of God, every single person on earth, everyone, whether they, whether they put faith in Christ or not. They're, Im, they're his image bearers, worthy of dignity, worthy of respect, and yes, worthy of love. Jesus died for these people. Uh, these are people who are, that we're called to be salt and light to. So there's just two types of people, people that we have a unique responsibility to love in a sacrificial way who are our brothers and sisters, or people that we have a unique and special obligation to love them in a unique and sacrificial way who we're trying to reach for the gospel. What we don't have is a category for being hateful and dismissive for anyone ever, ever. Second letter of of Corinthians says the love of Christ compels us because we have concluded that one has died for all, therefore all have died. That I'm, I'm not, I, I, he died for everyone. That, that he demonstrates his love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So who, who am I to disregard somebody that Jesus loved so much he died for, even if they don't know it, even if they don't believe it yet? Let me give you some practical ways this, this one kind of shakes out in uh, this, this a disposition of optimism, hope, and grace, and I'll move on from it. Um, Assume the best motives of others. Um, look for the good and call it out. That's that commendable thing. Don't be easily offended. Everybody's so easily offended. It's like the most popular thing in the world to talk about how we're offended. And that, that's, sometimes we're offended. Okay. You know what? The Proverbs actually says it is to your glory to overlook an offense. To, not, not to God's glory. It's actually saying it's good for you to sometimes go, huh, I believe I am offended. I think I will overlook it. <laughs> I'm just going to move on and I'm not going to exact justice on anybody or anything. I'm just going to not everything, but sometimes that happens. Sometimes that can happen. In the, in the event that we are offended, we talk to people and not talk about them. How about that? Just quit talking about, about people. Um, we become the first to apologize and the first to forgive. I have that word grace in here um, about the, the disposition of, of uh, hope and optimism, but also the word grace because grace includes um, un, um, unearned favor. It's not something you earn. You don't need to look and say, are you worthy of me? Just go ahead and they're not. Neither are you. That's what grace is. Uh, And it also includes forgiveness. Do Do you need to engage in the very difficult work? I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm just saying it's worth it. The very difficult work of forgiveness. And if you're finding it so hard to forgive, it may be that you're no longer amazed that you're forgiven by God. And that's a really sad place to be. You won't be thankful to him or for him from that place. Romans 12, 18, another gut puncher. It says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with everyone. So it just puts the gospel nuance on us. For this last one, I got one more and then we'll shut it down. But this last one, I want us to look back in the text in Philippians at verse 7. Actually, just let me look at you with the, let me hit you with the verse 8. I didn't mean to hit you, but you know what I mean. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. I yearn for you. He wants these people. But what's he want them with? His good heart. He's got a good heart, but it's because it's full of Jesus. With the affection of Jesus Christ. Now skip down to verse 11. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. The third thing is a heart full of Jesus Christ. That's the third, that's the third um, ingredient in a recipe that can be thankful for every person, even the flawed ones, by way of the gospel. When we started talking about Thanksgiving a couple weeks ago, we said true Thanksgiving goes all the way up to Jesus, and it it does. There's nothing more sad in all the world than an atheist who who experiences the sense of warm gratitude and has nowhere to take it. Nowhere to take it. The, The people in your life in my life. They were placed there by the hands that bled and died for us. He loves us 
endless lead. He loves us beyond sensibilities. His love is amazing. I have failed him countless times, but his love has never failed me. I've acted like a fool, and at times I've disregarded him. Sometimes I've been embarrassed. Sometimes I've been embarrassed. He's never once been embarrassed of me. One wise author said, the person who loves their dream of community will destroy it, but the person who loves those around them will create community. That's true. Our dream of community isn't as good as what God has for us when we simply love others. It's not simple, I know, but love others the way Jesus Christ has loved us. What would it look like for you to be so close to Jesus Christ this season and hopefully in every season? Be so close to Jesus Christ that you can love others the way Christ has loved you. Flaws and all. So here's my prayer. Here's my prayer for us. It comes from Colossians chapter 3, 12 through 15. I'll read it to you. It says, put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. Listen, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another in love. And if anyone has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must You must also forgive. And above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect, listen to this word, harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. Last three words, and be thankful. And be thankful. I circled that word harmony. You know what harmony is? It's it's usually referred to in music. I was with a group of brothers uh, here recently, and we were singing the doxology together, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. And the guy over to my right heard all of our voices, just five of us singing, and he he picked up on the harmony. I don't hear them. Some of y'all, these guys up here do, right? But I don't hear harmonies. He heard it, and then he changed his, the pitch, I think that's the right thing. He changed the pitch of his voice to complement ours and made it sound better. He's different, we're different, but we make a more beautiful sound together. He's deferring to us. He didn't say, I'm going to outsing you, you ought to be singing like this. No, he says, uh, I'm going to get in harmony with you. The, the, the definition of harmony is a pleasing combination of different parts. You know what, a, here we are back again, you know what a pleasing combination of different parts is also? It's football. <laughs> it really is. Is all, all of these brothers working together. I had a dude in the first service sitting out there and, and, and that's, you know, plays football for Gunner. He's wearing a shirt, literally wearing a shirt that says brotherhood on it. Rightfully so. Is all of these guys deferring to one another. I'm not you. You're not me. We love each other anyway. We got a common goal and we're willing to put up with a whole bunch of stuff for a really long time and keep on loving each other for a greater purpose than is before us. Y'all, if... Nothing against teenage boys. I'm proud of y'all, but if they can do it for the sake of football, can't we do it for the gospel? To love each other, to defer ourselves so that God may be further and the gospel may be known and people can just receive love. You're going to see a lot of football over this next few days. If you're not, just come talk to me. We'll pray together. I'll fix you up, tell you what you need to do. I hope when you see it that you see more than a game and that you might see the harmony with which it is played and that you might say, I'd like to, by way of the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ, see that kind of harmony coming out of me. Then I might love people around me with just a glimmer, just a faint glimmer of the love that Jesus Christ has given to me. Who am I? Who am I to let that terminate and stop on me? I need to be a vessel of that. And so do you. Joy. Is mentioned 16 times in the book of Philippians. It's called, been called the epistle of joy. You cannot sustain joy without a thankful heart. You know what well exceeds the number of times joy is used in the book of Philippians? Christ, 50 times. 50 times in four chapters. He's, he is our joy. He is our joy. And as we are thankful to him, then he can put into our hearts the ability to be thankful for the, even the people around us, even the most flawed of people around us. For their good, our good, and for the glory of God. Would y'all come on back up, please? And then would y'all bow your heads? 
and don't, I already read this to you, but don't let me sound eloquent, okay? This is from the Bible. I'm going to pray this over us from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, and I just pray that, that y'all might just receive it, not from me, but from the Lord. Just receive this prayer. Let's go to God. Father in heaven, allow us to put on as God's people that you have called holy and beloved. Let us put on compassionate hearts. Let us have kindness and humility and meekness and patience. God, supernaturally enable us to bear with one another. And and if we've got complaints and conflicts against each other, let us forgive each other. As you, Lord Jesus, have so graciously over and over and over forgiven us, remind us that we must forgive. God, above all this, help us to put on love and let that love bind us together in a beautiful, Jesus-anointed, perfect harmony. Let the peace of Christ rule in my heart and in the hearts of my brothers and sisters to which we were called one body in God. If you would be so gracious to allow us and enable us to look at the nail-scarred hands of Jesus who bled for us and know that every provision is from him and allow us to be thankful, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.